Good morning. My name is Pastor Matt Alexander. I want to welcome you to worship here at First Baptist Church in Greenville. It is our prayer that the Lord meets you today, that you worship Him in spirit and truth, and that He speaks to your heart as uh, together we join in in worship of our Lord. Thank you for being with us today. Well, good morning, First Baptist. Our names are Jonathan and Emily Martin, and we are just overjoyed to be here with you all this morning and to worship God together. Can I invite you to sing as we lift our voices and our hearts to our great God together? Let's sing for joy. Thank you, Jonathan and Emily, for leading us before the throne in worship this morning. And I am excited for this Lord's Day that he has given us. And isn't it good to come into the Lord's presence with joy in our hearts? In fact, there's no other way that we should come. The psalmist in Psalm 122 in verse 1 said, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates 
Jerusalem. I pray that we come together this morning with a heart ready to worship the Lord. And I want to welcome you to our time of worship today. Uh, it is a joy and an honor to be in the Lord's presence. If you're... As we gather in the Lord's presence, would you join me uh, in a word of prayer before the Lord? Our Father, we come before your throne of mercy and grace today. And Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for the privilege that is ours to worship you. Lord, we're not worthy and God, uh, we certainly do not deserve to be in your family, in your presence this morning. But God, uh, not only have you saved us, you've equipped us, you've called us into worship. And Lord, you are worthy today. God, we want to come in this place no matter what uh, we've brought with us. May we leave it at your altar and may we come with joyful, expectant hearts ready to worship you in song. Not just from our lips, but Lord, from the overflow of our hearts. And God, as we open your word, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you convict us today where we need conviction? Would you encourage us where we need encouragement? Would you lead us in the truth that we might be salt and light in the world in which you've placed us? Thank you for this time and opportunity in this space. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. And well, let's stand and continue worshiping together. And let's acknowledge with our lips that The Lord alone is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. Let's sing to him as his people.
7 says, And Lord, now for what do I wait? My hope is from you. As we sing this next song, let's fix our minds on Christ, who truly is our hope in life, in whatever we're facing, whether it's troubles within or without, and knowing that he also is the master of death. He is our hope in every season, forever and ever. Let's sing to our faithful God. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from Him? What will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. the Lord we are his children and he is our portion now and forevermore
Spirit Speak, and we're honored to get to share it with you this morning and to sing it alongside your choir. This song comes out of many passages of scripture, but mainly out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which says this, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. We have not only an all-powerful, wise God, but a good God who delights in revealing himself to us. And so this song is our prayer for him to do exactly what he delights to do as we open God's word together, which is to reveal Jesus to us through his spirit as we open his word. If you catch on with the chorus of this song, it's really simple. We'd love to have you sing along with us. Who can know the thoughts of a man unless his spirit reveals them? And who can know the thoughts of God unless his spirit reveals them to Give us 
Amen. I love the simple but profound message of that song. If that can be our prayer every time we come to open the Word of God, it's just for the Holy Spirit to speak to us because it's His Word. He's going to be faithful to His Word, and there's nothing we need more than the Holy Spirit to speak His Word into our hearts and lives. So thank you so much, Jonathan and Emily and Choir, for leading us in that song. And as we have been working through the message of Hebrews... Uh, We're coming to our second to last message in the book of Hebrews, so I pray it's been a fruitful journey for you. We know that uh, a passage that we've uh, referenced often is that uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us the Word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so as we come to God's Word every single time, whether it's in corporate worship, whether it's in personal study or your uh, devotional time with the Lord, indeed we ask the Lord to speak to us through his word, to make his word alive into our life, to convict us where we need conviction, and to encourage us where we need encouragement. In the last two weeks, we've been looking at this passage in Hebrews 13, which is speaking to us uh, corporately about obligations within the church. I I said a number of weeks ago when we began chapter 13 that chapter 13 is that wonderful uh, practical end to this very theologically driven letter. And so by now, you understand that the writer of Hebrews uh, thinks very highly of Christ, as he should. He knows that Christ is uh, the one by which uh, all names and all feet will one day bow. He knows that he's king of kings and lord of lords. He knows that our sacrifice is secure in and through him, that we didn't have to bring an offering, an animal offering with us today and burn it out back before we could come into the presence of God. Jesus Christ is that eternal, sufficient sacrifice for us. And that alone is worthy of worship every single day of our life. And I just love the message of Hebrews because over and over and over again, he reaches back to that Jewish understanding and showing us that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. You realize that today, right? No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what questions you came here with, what burdens you came here with, Jesus is enough because he's met our greatest need that we ever would have. And so we can trust him with everything else. And when we come to chapter 13, he gives us a very practical uh, conclusion to the reality of who Jesus is. And we've looked at some personal aspects of that. We've looked at some corporate aspects of that as it involves church life. Uh, Last week, we talked about 
our uh, response to leaders who have gone before us, um, and our response to giving him a sacrifice of praise from the fruit of our lips, that every time that you give God uh, praise, that is a sacrifice that he receives and he is worthy of. Uh, He ended last week by saying, Do not neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Every time you do good in the name of Christ, you are giving a sacrifice to the Lord. We pick up in verse 17 through verse 19 this morning, and we're going to look at the second part of what we began last week. And he says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. We said last week that what God is looking for today and has always been looking for is those who would be faithful. God is just simply looking for men and women, boys and girls, who would give God his yes and just be faithful. Uh, We said that Moses, when God um, called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, Moses didn't have it all together. Moses was not equipped before God called him. Moses had many excuses why God could not use him, and yet God ultimately got Moses to the place where he could give God his yes, and he would be obedient to God and be faithful to God, and God used him as the great leader of Israel. And all throughout the Bible, whoever you want to choose, God is looking for those who would be faithful. And in my life and in your life in the church today, God is just looking for a church that would be faithful. We don't have to be perfect. We can't be perfect. We don't have, all, have to have all the answers because we don't have all the answers. We don't have to uh, meet some sort of earthly criteria. All we have to do is be faithful to Jesus, to his word, and to follow the, the call that he's placed on us in this life. But how do we do that? Well, in Hebrews 13, he's, he's answering that question for this troubled church who were facing many threats from without, even some with within. You remember they were uh, weary of giving up. They were on the verge, many of them, for giving up on the Christian life. And that's why he gives us that great chapter in chapter 11 to say, look at all these who have gone before you. And and they had hardship in life. They had trouble in life. And yet they uh, continued because of a heavenly call that they could not see yet. They lived by faith. And they finally received their reward. And so we too in life are not promised that when we follow Jesus, everything is always going to go our way. In fact, if you're really following Jesus, more times things are going to go against you. Because you're living countercultural to the world. You're You're swimming upstream. You're being faithful to the message of God and not to the message of the world. And and the point here in this practical section is just simply faithfulness. And last week we looked at what some things that faithful Christians do. And I told you that's not at all an all-inclusive list. He's just pointing out some things uh, in the context of what he's already speaking about. I want to finish that this morning by looking at some more things faithful Christians do. And the first one is this. Faithful Christians submit to godly leadership. Faithful Christians submit to godly leadership, Keyword: godly, God-honoring, God-called leadership. He says in verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. Remember back in um, <clears throat> earlier, he called us uh, to remember our leaders. He said, remember those who have gone before you. And we said that is an active remembrance. It's not looking back and remembering their name. It's not looking back and remembering something they said or did. It is looking back and learning from them. And we said that we all, and basically he was speaking of leaders who have gone on before us, probably already with the Lord. And granted, you and I all have men and women in our life who have impacted us in the faith, and they're already in the presence of Jesus for all eternity. And he's telling the church, remember them actively, and that you honor them, you learn from them, you follow what they've taught you. Well, we pick up in verse 17, and he gives us uh, a call to submit to present leadership over us. Excuse me. He says in verse 17, obey your leaders 
and submit to them. Second time he mentions godly leadership in this short context. He's now calling on these believers to submit to present godly leadership, church leadership, ministry leadership, uh, leadership that God has placed in their life, to submit to those leaders as past leaders were worthy of remembrance, present leaders are worthy of respect and submission. Godly leadership has always been needed and critical in the history of God working with his people. It's always been important. God has always worked through leaders. Uh, God... Even when he created Adam and Eve in the garden, the first uh, two humans, he gave them leadership. He called them to uh, subdue the garden, to work the garden. He called them to uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they were to lead their family. Adam as the head of the family is to lead. And God uh, uh, called, we've already mentioned Moses. God worked through Moses. God worked through Noah in a very evil day to, to lead and to do what God said, ultimately to build a big boat when it had never rained before. Many times leaders are called crazy by the world. Think of how much Noah was called crazy. God gave the prophets. God gave the kings leadership. God sent Jesus, greatest leader who's ever walked the earth, and modeled servant leadership for us. God gave the disciples to found the church and lead the church, equip the church. God gave Paul. Ultimately, God founded the church, and he placed an authority over the church. Number one, Jesus, he's the only head of the church. I had a a professor in seminary, a theology professor in seminary that said he was a pastor of a particular church one time, and after a service, uh, one of the deacons came in a service upset about something and told him, uh, I am the head of this church. (laughs) And he said, I fell in fear right then for that man who thought he was the head of the church of Christ. The Bible is very clear. Christ is only the head of the church, but under the headship of Christ, he's given uh, uh, duties and offices of pastors and other leadership, and he's always worked that way because God is a God of order and structure, and the writer of Hebrews knows that. He is one of them, speaking as a pastoral leader to these believers. And he's, he's understanding that leadership has always been important. God has always called leaders. The Bible always speaks to the necessity of Christians to submit to those placed over them. If you ever get to a place in the Christian life where you think you don't have to submit to authority, to a respect authority, to, to leadership over you, then that is a dangerous place for all of us. Because no matter where we get, We're always called to honor and respect our leaders. And in some form, God has always placed some type of leader over us. But this is not blanket obedience here. He's not saying uh, obey and submit to any leader who would lead you to do anything in life, biblical or unbiblical. It's not what he's saying. He doesn't give leaders the out for unbiblical leadership. This is leadership that submits to the power of the Holy Spirit and biblical authority over the people of God. We all can think of examples. Maybe you have personal examples, tragically, but we all can think of examples in life where so-called leaders have used the title of leadership to lead people away from God. Decades ago, there was a man named Jim Jones who led a cult in the name of, quote, godly leadership, led people to very literally drink the Kool-Aid and kill some 900 people in the name of allegiance, not really to God, but to himself. It's not leadership the Bible calls us to submit to. There have been countless stories throughout history. This is not what the Bible is calling for. Godly leadership is leadership which submits to the, is led by the Holy Spirit, submits to the Holy Spirit, submits to biblical authority. And when we as Christians have that kind of leadership over us, you know what it should be? It should be a joyful experience for us and an honor to submit and to obey such leadership. And he, he, he says this as he uh, goes on in verse 17. He says, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
He tells us several things about godly leadership and and why we need to obey and submit to godly leadership over us. First of all, God-appointed leaders are fulfilling fulfilling their high calling to keep watch over the souls which they're leading. The Bible is very clear. Many places in Scripture say that leaders will uh, will have to stand before God and give an account for those to whom they lead. And that's why uh, the Bible says not many should aspire to be leaders. Because they will stand before God and the greater uh, um, amount of authority that God gives, the greater responsibility one has and the greater account one will give. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that right here. He says, they keep watch over your souls, speaking to the church, as those who will give an account. Literally, that word keep watch in the Greek is to keep awake. Keep up awake. So uh, any pastoral leader who puts you to sleep is not worth following, right? <laughs> a little sidebar there. But it's to keep, wa- keep awake, spiritually awake. And that means leaders are charged with the responsibility of knowing the culture, knowing the signs of the times, having a finger on uh, the pulse of the, the, the culture and the way the world is going, and being a student of God's Word, being in the Word, not just on Sunday morning, but in his life throughout the week, and, and, and addressing the body, keeping the church awake, so that those who are part of the church are not falling sway into the world. It's a great authority that's... Spiritual leaders have a a great privilege, a great responsibility spiritual leaders have. And he says, they will keep watch and they will give an account. Which brings me to the second reason why we are to obey them. All such leaders will answer to God at the judgment seat for their work. The Bible is very clear over and over again. Anybody who has ever had a spiritual leadership position, whether past or present, will stand before God one day and give an account for how they led the people of God. And thirdly, he says, as those who will give an account so that they can do this, look what he says, with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. The last reason is that believers' obedience will bring joy instead of pain to leaders. Leadership can be a lonely place. Anybody who's ever held that spot knows it. Spiritual leadership can be a lonely place. Just look at current statistics of those in ministry and how quickly pastors are leaving the ministry. Not even because of a moral failure or some unbiblical reason, but just because they're tired. They're lonely. It's a lonely place. Because most churches in uh, the world today are not in healthy shape, sadly. And it's a struggle. They don't have the joy and the privilege and the honor that our staff have here at First Baptist of leading a joyful congregation who willingly and lovingly submits and trusts biblical authority. But there is pushback at every turn. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. It's far too common than we want to imagine. And he's saying here, don't be that kind of Christian. God has, God, that... The, if you don't agree with the leadership, God will take care of the leadership sooner or later. Because if he's wrong, he will give an account for that. If he's right, then God will honor him in time for that. But we submit because it's a, our biblical authority. We obey because it's a joy. And it brings joy to those who lead. And so, what is our, one of our spiritual obligations? We su- support spiritual leaders as they stay faithful to biblical authority over them secondly faithful christians pray for their leaders pray for their leaders this is part of that support he says in verse 18 pray for us for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything just as clear as the necessity for obedience is the need for the church to pray for their leaders not go a step further because the Bible goes a step further, not just your church leaders, but your world leaders. Anybody who's charged with leadership over you, church, we have a responsibility more than we complain about it to pray for them. Maybe they're in the shape they're in because we as Christians are not praying. The writer made clear that his conscience was clear because he had upheld personal and ministry integrity in his life. Oh, for leaders who could say that today, by the way. I heard just this week of another leader in our convention who has been dismissed of a position because of lack of integrity. 
It's all too common. It seems like more leaders are failing today than ever before. And the writer of Hebrews says, pray for us because we always need prayer and we are convinced that we have a clear conscience over you because we conduct ourselves honorably, with integrity, with godliness in everything we do. If you're in any kind of leadership position, in fact, if you're a Christian in whatever you do, that should be the aim of your life. David said, I am committed to walk with integrity in my own house. Those who know you best, do they see a person of integrity and moral and biblical uprightness? But he says, pray for us. Faithful Christians pray for their leaders. A leader is not always going to do things you agree with. A leader is called to make decisions, and sometimes you don't agree with those decisions. Sometimes we don't agree with them simply because we don't have the perspective that the leader has. And we're called to pray. Prayer is the driving force for seeing the work of God in the midst of church today, not just for leadership, but in everything we do. Listen how prayer in the church has been viewed in the history of Christianity. I want to read this snippet to you about D.L. Moody. We're to pray for our leaders. It is recorded that D.L. Moody, founder of Moody Bible Institute, repeatedly appropriated the wisdom of this command. For example, during his great turn-of-the-century evangel evangelistic endeavors, he often wired R.A. Torrey at the school asking for prayer. And in response, the faculty and students would pray late into the evening and sometimes all night bringing great power to Moody's fairway ministries. After Moody's death, Torrey himself preached in many countries backed up by an immense chain of prayer. In Australia, 2,100 home prayer groups met for two weeks before he arrived. As a result, there was a great power in his preaching, and many lives were changed. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the peerless Victorian preacher of London, told his vast congregation as he concluded his sermon delivered May 27th, 1855, My people, shall I ever lose your prayers? Will you ever cease your supplications? Will you ever cease to pray? I fear you have not uttered so many prayers this morning as you should have done. I fear there has not been so much earnest devotion as might have been poured forth. For my own part, I have not felt the wondrous power I sometimes experience. If we desire prayer in our lives and in our churches, then we simply must pray. I am personally, ministerially convinced that there is nothing the church in the wicked world that we live in today, there's nothing the church needs more than the presence of God. Whatever we're going through, whatever decisions we're facing, whatever context we're placed in, we need experiences week after week where the people of God come to worship God and simply experience it. If you were here last Sunday night, you heard Fred Luter speak to that and not letting Jesus pass you by, but having an encounter with Jesus. And he gave us a great charge to really, every time you open the Bible, every time you get along with the Lord, every time you come to church, are you praying for an encounter with God? I'm also convinced that the two most holy places in any building that where a church meets are the pulpit, where the word of God should be preached. If the word is not, God is not being preached, then we don't need to hang around there. But it's the word of God, uh, the pulpit where the word of God is being preached. And this altar, where it's a place to kneel and pray and respond before the Lord. And many times we have preachers failing to preach the word of God because they're afraid of what it may cost them. And like Paul, they need to hear the charge that he told Timothy just to preach the word in season and out of season. Don't be an ear tickler. Preach the word because, church, our world is quickly going to hell. If you've not realized that, then it's time to wake up. And the answer is not more morality. The answer does not come from the university or the philosophical system. The answer is found in the presence of God and the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you're in sin, you're in worldliness, or you're watching and you're struggling, you're caught up in your own sinful lifestyle, let today be enough. 
Jesus loves you. His grace, his mercy is there. And our purpose, the purpose as the church is to gather and worship the Lord and then to reach out to a lost and dying world with the message that we have a loving Savior and his grace and mercy is new every single day. And we need to realize, church, the importance of prayer to that end. I think sometimes we worry as a church, if I time of response if I'm constantly at the altar people are going to be wondering what's going on in my life that's on them that's on them they will stand before God one day and give an account for that judgmental attitude but do we have the kind of faithfulness the kind of heart the kind of obedience, the kind of longing, the kind of yearning, the kind of eager expectation that says, God, I don't care what's going on around me. God, I don't care what people think. God, I just want you. And I want you to do work in my church. I want you to do work in families. I want you to do work in this city, in this state, in this world. God, I have lost people that I know, and I want them to come to you. And I believe God still wants to bring revival because I think we're seeing it happen in certain places. But you know where we're seeing revival happen? It's where we've always seen revival happen. When God's people get serious about seeking and and calling on and praying before the Lord. When we come and we bow, and I'm not saying that's the only way you have to pray because some of us are physically not able to do that. But in, our t- in time of response corporately, at your time at home, when we bow before the Lord, we're simply saying, Lord, I'm humbly falling in your presence. And God, there's nothing I have that um, I can do on my own. And simply, God, I just need more of you. And the writer here is saying, Pray for us. And as he's saying, pray for us, he's basically saying, make prayer a priority. Make prayer a priority in the church. When we call things a prayer meeting at church, we don't have the crowds we have when we call it other things. And that tells something of our heart as Christians. Wonder what it would be like today if 21 homes across America hosted prayer gatherings like they did before Tory visited Australia. You know what Billy Graham said was a lot of the success of his worldwide crusades was not what happened when he walked out on that stage or what happened when the team got there before he did to repair the stadium. He said it what happened in the prayer room weeks before he arrived. And how many people have come to know the Lord through the ministry of that man alone. Don't underestimate the value of prayer. Don't let anybody keep you from praying. Would you simply, would we as a church move in to the days ahead, making prayer a priority, which leads me to the last and final point. He says in verse 19, And I urge you all the more to what? To pray. So that I may be restored to you very soon. But he says, I urge you all the more. Not to write letters for me. Not to encourage me so that I may come. Not to seek the government authorities to make the way for me to arrive. He says, I urge you all the more to pray. And that's, the last point is this. Faithful Christians understand The urgency. Faithful Christians understand the urgency. Understand the urgency of the gospel. Understand the urgency of godly living. Understand the urgency of worship. In this context, understand the urgency of prayer. Don't start tomorrow what is needed today. Don't start tomorrow what is needed today. I simply ask, do you live with gospel and prayerful urgency as a Christian? 
If not, why not? The Bible says we need to. Holy Spirit equips us to. And the world is longing for us to. Don't start tomorrow what is needed today. When we take prayer seriously, we begin to see God move in fresh and much needed ways. I don't think the question is today whether God wants to revive us, to restore us, to renew us, whatever you want to call it. I don't think the question is whether God wants to. He wants to. The question is, are we ready? And the reason he hasn't, if he hasn't, is because we're simply not to the place where we can receive it. And you say, how do I get there? Well, first of all, if you're not a follower of Christ and you know that with all certainty, then in just a moment in our time of response, you need to know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but only through me. doesn't matter what your life, what has filled your life. doesn't matter what the past has looked like. Paul said, I forget the past and I press on towards the Father. What's ahead? And you know today, whatever we're in the midst of, if you are a sinner in need of salvation, Jesus is your only way to be right with God, and he will save you by his grace and mercy. And he wants to do that. And all you need to do is respond in faith, and he will meet you there. And then you need to make that public. If you're here, you need to make that public. If you're watching online, there's going to be some information there. You need to reach out to us, and we can help walk you in those next steps. If you're not a child of God, and you know you're not a child of God, a follower of Christ, then that's your first step. Secondly, if you know you're a Christian, but you've not been living in that gospel urgency, it starts in prayer. It starts by coming back to the Lord in repentance. It starts by understanding the the call that God has placed on your life. Whatever your profession looks like, whatever your daily life looks like, God has placed a call on your life as a Christian, and that is to take the gospel urgently and seriously and to live it out and to take prayer seriously. And maybe God has laid a specific decision on your heart, but the urgency of the matter is we don't put off for tomorrow. What needs to happen today? And I wonder this morning if we could just long for God just by kneeling at this altar as a church. If you can physically and just saying, maybe it's a need that you have personally. Maybe it's just to come and just do what the writer's telling us to do. Just pray for the gospel to go forth in our life, in our relationships, in our communities, in this world. Pray for our leaders and make it a constant commitment that we would do that. There are some obligations that we have as Christians. And we don't get to pick and choose what they are, what what the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the Word of God. We're either going to faithfully obey or we're going to disobey as we refuse to submit to that. But every head bowed and every eye closed, I just simply ask this morning, what is God speaking to you right now in the urgency of the moment in how you need to respond to him? Whether it's salvation or Christian, whether it's a commitment that you need to make, an action that you need to take, a step of faithfulness that you need to uh, be more faithful in, Don't put off for tomorrow what needs to happen today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, which is with us and convicts us, but also encourages us. Thank you for your grace, which meets us right here today. Lord, as we've heard this challenge from the writer of Hebrews, as we've heard this word, we pray that we take it to heart that we hear you speak to us and that we respond in faithful obedience. Lord, make us a prayerful people, not caring about anything but what pleases you. And Lord, as we do that, we know that we will see your faithfulness, we will see your hand, and we will see you do things among us that we could never take credit for. Lord, that's what we want. That's what we long for. That's what we expect. 
Now, God, would you speak to our hearts and move us to the place where you would have us. All in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I pray that the Lord has spoken to your heart in some way. And if he's laid a specific decision uh, on your heart today, please notice the contact information there on your screen and reach out to us. One of our staff members would love to connect with you and walk with you through any decision that the Lord may have laid on your heart. And we also want to invite you to our uh, Sunday evening services that we're calling Awesome August here at First Baptist Church. Each Sunday at 5 p.m. we're having a special guest preacher and musician to lead us in a time of worship. You can notice that schedule there on your screen and please make plans to be with us uh, each Sunday evening here at First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today.